And good evening, everyone. Welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Thank you for joining us this Thursday evening. Well, tonight, as you'd guess, it is all about impeachment as we have history in our very, very recent rearview mirror. Now, a man who was a member of the Democratic Senate leadership during the Clinton impeachment, that senator will join us tonight. We'll also be hearing from a former top advisor to President Clinton, who was also an attorney for the Senate Judiciary and a former federal prosecutor. We'll also be looking at how impeachment is playing out in the media. I'll give you a hint. People on Fox are hearing a very different story than viewers of other channels. Now, before we get to our guests, let me bring in senior political correspondent Andrew Whitman, who joins us with the latest impeachment news out of Washington. And Andrew, the news didn't end with a vote last night. It didn't, but really more reaction than action today, Rich. But there are some developments to share. President Trump, while continuing to bash his impeachment and referring to Democrats as traitors, is insisting he wants a trial in the Senate. He says he wants to be acquitted and he wants the Senate to vindicate him ahead of the election. He also thinks impeachment will help him next November. Now that thinking flies in the face of some Republicans who are seeking a quick dismissal or not having a trial at all. This, as the White House confirmed, it is still working in lockstep with Mitch McConnell on a possible trial. McConnell is worried that if a trial included witnesses, the Senate would need to vote on each one of them, which could put vulnerable Democrats in even more difficulty with those votes. McConnell leading the pack of Republicans seeking a quick trial. But there's even less certainty tonight as to when a Senate trial might actually begin. Before that can happen, the House has to pass a vote to allow Nancy Pelosi to transmit impeachment to the Senate. They still haven't taken that vote. Now, if the vote doesn't happen tomorrow, the next scheduled day it could happen would be Tuesday, January 7th. But McConnell has already said he wants the trial to begin on Monday, January the 6th. Now, Pelosi has delayed this step as she waits for what she considers to be a fair trial process to be laid out by the Senate. Mitch McConnell addressed that and took some shots at Democrats as he spoke this morning on the Senate floor. If the Speaker ever gets her house in order, that mess will be dumped over here on the Senate's lap. If the Senate blesses this slapdash impeachment, if we say that from now on this is enough, then we invite an endless parade of impeachable trials. And a short time after those remarks, Minority Leader Chuck Schumer responded. In Leader McConnell's 30-minute screed, he did not make one argument why the witness and document should not be part of the trial. The president was invited to provide witnesses and provide documents at every stage of the process. He chose not to. Still, Democrats are offering the president due process again here in the Senate. The witnesses we suggest are top Trump appointed officials. They aren't Democrats. We don't know if their testimony would exculpate the president or incriminate him, but their testimony should be heard. We also heard from Speaker Pelosi, who also weighed in on McConnell. I heard some of what Mitch McConnell said today, and it reminded me that our founders, when they wrote the Constitution, uh, they suspected that there could be a rogue president. I don't think they suspected that we could have a rogue president and a rogue leader in the Senate at the same time. Rich. Andrew, thank you. Now joining me is former Senator Byron Dorgan of North Dakota. He's a man who's been in through impeachments in the past, as he was in Democratic leadership during the Clinton trial. Both last night and this morning, I know you described Washington today as as rancid as you've ever seen it in your lifetime. Um, was last night a necessary step? Um, did the evidence compel Democrats to go where they went? Well, Richard, I think it did. I mean, I, I don't think you can just ignore th the kinds of things that we've discovered, and that is uh, the president calling the president of the Ukraine and saying to the president of the Ukraine, uh, we want you to do an investigation or announce an investigation, at least, of my potential opponent in the United States next year. and. Uh, if you if you do that, we will release the money that's now held, the $400 million plus um, of aid for the Ukraine, and uh, we'll invite you to the White House uh, for a visit. You know, look, that that's not something that uh, we can allow to stand. That's uh, it really is a form of bribery, a form of blackmail, uh, and and asking another country to cheat uh, on our election, inviting them into our election process. 
uh, and cheat on behalf of Donald Trump. I mean, we just cannot decide that uh, that's okay. It's not okay. And I don't think the House had any choice but to go to impeachment resolutions. Going back to the Clinton impeachment, when confronted with the evidence um, and completely abhorrent behavior, at least Clinton showed contrition. And he cooperated with the investigation. He turned over the documents. He himself um, gave a deposition. And moreover, uh, he allowed members of his administration to participate. I'm curious from your end, not just in this moment, but going forward, if somehow the president's behavior is excused by the Senate, are you more concerned about the abuse of power, about how any president of any party could use his or her office to advance their own interests, or the idea that when confronted, they can just not only not participate or cooperate, but be an impediment to the entire process, and in effect, almost be codified that they're above the law, the obstruction charge, which to you do you believe is more dangerous for us as a republic? Well, I, I think both are very dangerous, you know, to, to, uh, to decide that the presidency is above the law and whatever they wish to do as presidents, they will do and uh, there's no consequence for it. I mean, that, that's not a presidency. That's, that's uh, king and royal subjects, apparently, at least uh, when you look at what the Republicans in the House and the Senate uh, have done and are prepared to do. But, you know, the other side of this, just leaving the legal issues aside, I think the lack of, uh, of character and, and decency and dignity, uh, it, it's, it, it really bothers me to see a president of the United States that cares little about those and demonstrates none of those uh, characteristics. Uh, well, obviously, we don't impeach someone for that. The American people uh, elected him. Uh, but uh, the, the impeachment is about something vastly different, and that is, he says, I'm above the law. Uh, you can't touch me. I won't release data. I won't re allow people to testify. And uh, by the way, I can call a president of a foreign country and ask them to get involved in the U.S. election on my behalf to, uh, you know, to try to injure my opponent, and it's okay. Well, that's not okay, and it will never be okay. I, I want to remind our audience, and you obviously know these men personally, but Two, um, McConnell, who we heard from, and also Lindsey Graham, and how different their takes were 20 years ago um, versus where we are now vis-a-vis -vis, uh, where, uh, what the role of the Senate should be as related to the Clinton affair, and now what the Senate should or more specifically shouldn't do. Here they are then and now. There have been 15 impeachments in the history of this country. Two of them were cut short. Uh, by resignations. In the other 13 impeachments, there were witnesses. It's not unusual to have a witness in, in a trial. It's uh, certainly not unusual to have a witness in an impeachment trial. But, well, the, the House managers have only asked for three witnesses. I think that's uh, pretty modest. The Senate is meant to act as judge and jury, to hear a trial, not to rerun the entire fact-finding investigation because angry partisans rush sloppily through it. Everything I do during this, I'm coordinating with White House counsel. There will be no difference between the president's position and our position as to uh, how to handle this uh, to the extent that we can. House members have said, I will not vote for an impeachment. Let me tell you, please don't say that until you understand what you're voting on. Members of the Senate have said, I understand everything there is about this case, and I won't vote to impeach the president. Please allow the facts to do the talking. Nobody knows whether the president, what the articles of impeachment are. People have made up their mind in a political fashion that will hurt this country long term. I'm not trying to hide the fact that I have disdain for the accusations in the process, so I don't need any witnesses. Uh, the president can make a request to call witnesses. They can make a, requ a request to call Mike Pence and Pompeo and Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. I am ready to vote on the underlying articles. I don't really need to hear a lot of witnesses. Help me out, Senator, in that a lot of us know these. I may have interviewed them, but when the cameras aren't on, and they're not in front of C-SPAN, and you guys are in the cloakroom. What's happened to Lindsey Graham? I, I, for me, at least, he was never as transactional as this seems to be. Uh, you don't have to go back that far. Even look what he said about Trump during the campaign, um, and now where he is. It, both him and McConnell, not only the rules have changed, but 
I would have got if they said, listen, what he did was wrong, but it's not impeachable. They're completely defending him at every turn. And for you who know them on a personal basis, does it at all coincide with the men that you used to serve with? It, it does not. I mean, I, look, Lindsey Graham and I, we've been friends for a long time. In fact, he wrote a little blurb for the back cover of my first book a long, long time ago. Uh, I know Lindsey well. I have, I, there is no way I can explain what has happened there. None. I've been a friend of John McCain's for years, the late John McCain, and Lindsey was as well. And I, but I, I don't know what has gone uh, I was going to say going wrong. I don't know what is different here. I can't explain what has happened with respect to Lindsey Graham. With respect to Mitch McConnell, uh, let me just say Mitch McConnell has a lot to atone for in my judgment. Uh, you go back to the Merrick Garland case with respect to the Supreme Court. I mean, th that's just the stealing of a Supreme Court nominee in my judgment by refusing even to meet with him, let alone have a hearing. But also, you talk about partisanship, rancid partisanship. I mean, Mitch McConnell has decided to imprison virtually everything good that has been enacted from the U.S. House, much of it bipartisan. And it, it, it's on the calendar. It sits there, and Mitch McConnell will not to touch any of it. And uh, he just, I think he has a lot to atone for here with respect to his uh, actions in the U.S. Senate as majority leader. You mentioned the rancid culture, and I think if we... Not that we needed another example of it, but we got one last night when there was a sober undertaking of the impeachment of the president, something on, uh, let's one hand, we can count the times it's happened in our nation's history. The president had a rally in Michigan. And there was one moment where, again, a person that's an institution, was an institution in Washington that you knew as well, former Congressman Dingell, who has passed away in less than 12 years, and his widow now holds his seat this is what he said about the late congressman on his, the turf of his home state. Debbie Dingell, that's a real beauty. So she calls me up like eight months ago. Her husband was there a long time. But I didn't give him the B treatment. I didn't give him the C or the D. I could have. She calls me up. It's the nicest thing that's ever happened. Thank you so much. John would be so thrilled. He's looking down. He'd be so thrilled. Thank you so much, sir. I said, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Maybe he's looking up. I don't know. <laughs> um, to me, I don't expect more from him at this point, Senator, but I was really surprised by the paucity of voices. I know Congressman Upton, uh, a Republican, said that the Ingle, Dingles deserved an apology, but he was one of a handful that have said anything that that went too far. Do you recognize Washington now? And moreover, are there any lines that we won't cross? Well, that, that's, uh, that line was just another exhibit of the lack of decency and the lack of character by the president. But uh, things have changed here dramatically. And I, I would never, ever, ever have thought that uh, someone like Donald Trump would come in assume the White House, and then essentially just corner all of the senators and representatives on the Republican side to follow him off whatever cliff he decides to march toward. Uh, I'm, I'm very surprised by that. I mean, there was a time when things worked here, not perfectly, but, you know, it, it was all about compromise. The lubrication of democracy is when we feel differently about things, we get together and then try to evaluate how do we reach some sort of common ground to move things forward. That's the lubrication of democracy. Compromise is the way you solve problems in a democracy. Uh, there's precious little of that these days. Senator Dorgan, I really appreciate the time today. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks very much. I appreciate it. All right, everyone, when we come back, a former top advisor to President Clinton will join us to compare then to now and also take a look at where we head from here once impeachment heads over to the Senate.